The Ghost Coach, by Amelia B. Edwards. One. This is a true story. Although twenty years have passed since that night, I can still remember everything about it very clearly indeed. During those twenty years, I have told the story to only one other person. I still feel uncomfortable about telling it. Be patient with me, please. Do not argue, and do not try to explain anything. I do not want your explanations. I do not welcome your arguments. I was there after all, and I have had twenty years to think about it. I had been shooting in the lonely hills in the north of England. I had been out all day with my gun, but without success. It was December, and a bitterly cold east wind was blowing. Snow was beginning to fall from a heavy grey sky. It was becoming dark, and I realised that I had lost my way. I looked around me, and saw no signs of human life. Oh well, I thought, I must just keep on walking, and perhaps I'll find shelter somewhere. I put my gun under my arm and started walking. The snow fell heavily. It became very cold, and night was falling fast. I was very tired and hungry. I had been out all day, and I had eaten nothing since breakfast. I thought about my young wife and the hotel in the village. How worried she will be! I thought. I promised to come back before nightfall. I wish I could keep that promise. We had been married just four months. We loved each other very much. And of course, we were very happy together. I hated to worry her. Well, I thought, perhaps I'll find shelter somewhere. Perhaps I'll meet someone who can tell me how to get back to the hotel. Then, with luck, I'll see my dear wife before midnight. All the time, the snow was falling, and the night was becoming darker. Every few steps, I stopped and shouted. But the only sound in that wild, lonely place was the wind. I began to feel uneasy. I had read stories about travellers who were lost in the snow. They walked until they were too tired to walk any more. Then they lay down in the snow, and fell asleep, and never woke up again. That mustn't happen to me, I said to myself. I can't let it happen. I mustn't die when I have so much to live for. What would my poor wife do without me? I pushed away these frightening ideas. I shouted louder, and then listened for an answer. Above the sad, complaining sounds of the wind, I thought I heard a far-off cry. I shouted again, and again I imagined that I heard an answer. Then, out of the darkness, appeared a little white circle of light. It came nearer. It became brighter. I ran towards it as fast as I could, and found an old man with a lantern. Thank God! I cried. I was very, very pleased to see him. He did not look at all glad to see me. However, he lifted his lantern and stared into my face. What are you thanking God for? He growled. Well. I was thanking him for you. I was afraid that I was lost in the snow. Where are you trying to get to, Dwalding? How far is it from here? I asked. About twenty miles, the old man growled. So you are lost after all. Oh dear! And where is the nearest village? The nearest village is Wyke. And that's twelve miles away from here. Where do you live then? Over there, he said, pointing with the lantern. Are you going home then? I asked. Perhaps I am. Then please let me go home with you, I said. The old man shook his head. That's no good, he said. He won't let you in. Oh, I'm sure he will. I said, "Who is he?" My master. Who is your master? I asked. That's none of your business. 
was the old man's rude reply. Well, please take me to him. I'm sure that your master will give me shelter and supper tonight. Well, I don't think he will. But I suppose you can always ask, the old man said crossly. He shook his grey head again and started walking. I followed the light of his lantern through the falling snow. Suddenly, I saw a big black shape in the darkness. A huge dog came running towards me. It growled angrily. Down, king, said the old man. Is this the house? I asked. Yes, this is the house. Down, king. And he took a key out of his pocket. The door was huge and heavy. It looked like the door of a prison. The old man turned the key, and I saw my chance. Quickly, I pushed past him into the house. Two. I looked around me. I was in a very big high hall. While I was looking, a bell rang loudly. That's for you, said the old man. He gave an unfriendly smile. That's the master's room. Over there. He pointed to a low black door at the opposite side of the hall. I walked up to it and knocked loudly. Without waiting for an invitation, an old man with white hair was sitting at a table. Papers and books covered the table. He got up and looked very hard at me. Who are you? He said. How did you get here? And what do you want? My name is James Murray, I answered. I'm a doctor. I walked here across the hills. I need food, drink and sleep. This is not a hotel, he said. Jacob, why did you let this stranger into my house? I didn't let him in, growled the old man. He followed me home, and he pushed past me into the house. I couldn't stop him. He's bigger than I am. His employer turned to me. And why did you do that, sir? He asked. To save my life, I answered at once. To save your life? The snow is deep already, I replied. It will be deep enough to bury me before morning. He walked over to the window and looked out at the falling snow. It's true, he said at last. You may stay until morning if you wish. Jacob, bring our supper. Sit down, please. He sat down at the table again and began to read. I put my gun in a corner. I sat down near the fire and looked around me. This room was smaller than the hall, but I could see many unusual and interesting things in it. There were books on every chair. There were maps and papers on the floor. What an interesting room, I said to myself. And what a strange place to live. Here, in this lonely farmhouse, among these dark hills. I looked round the room, then I looked again at the old man. I wondered about him. Who is he? I thought. What is he? He had a big, beautiful head. It was covered with thick white hair. He had a strong, clever, serious face. There were lines of concentration across his wide, high forehead and lines of sadness around his mouth. Jacob brought in our supper. His master closed his book and invited me politely to the table. There was a large plate with meat, brown bread and eggs, and a pot of good, strong coffee. I hope you're hungry, sir, said the old man. I have nothing better to offer you. But my mouth was already full of bread and meat. It's excellent, I said gratefully. Thank you very much. You're welcome, he said, politely but coldly. His supper, I saw, was only bread and milk. We ate without speaking. The old man seemed sad. I tried to imagine why he lived such a quiet and lonely life in this far-off place. 
When we had finished, Jacob took the empty plates away, the window. It has stopped snowing, he said. I jumped up. Stopped snowing, I cried. Then perhaps... No, of course I can't. I can't walk twenty miles tonight. Walk twenty miles? repeated the old man in surprise. What do you mean? My wife is waiting for me, I said. She does not know where I am. I'm sure she's very worried. Where is she? At Dwalding, twenty miles away. At Dwalding, he said slowly. Yes, that's right. It is twenty miles away. But do you have to go there at once? Oh, yes, I answered. She'll be desperate with worry. I'll do anything. Well, said the old man, after a moment's hesitation. There is a coach. It goes along the old coach road every night, and it always stops at Dwalding. He looked at the clock on the wall. In about an hour and a quarter, the coach should stop at a signpost about five miles from here. Jacob can go with you and show you the old coach road that leads to the signpost. If he does that, do you think you'll be able to find the signpost all right? Easily. And thank you. He smiled for the first time and rang the bell. He gave Jacob his orders, then turned to me. You must hurry, he said, if you want to catch the coach. Good night. I thanked him warmly. I wanted to shake his hand, but he had already turned away.